After finally launching its first full-frame mirrorless cameras last year, Nikon has now jumped into the APS-C market with the Z50. At $850, it's squarely in the enthusiast category where lots of camera buyers are still spending their money. The Z50 is a debut model, but Nikon is jumping into a challenging market. It's got very strong competition from Sony's A6400, the Fujifilm X-T30, and Canon's M6 Mark II. When I saw the Z50 in October, I was impressed by how it handled. Now, I'm about to find out how it stacks up against its rivals in the crucial areas of autofocus, image quality, and 4K video features. Nikon decided to use the same Z mount on the Z50 that it uses on the Z6 and Z7. I think that was a good idea, as lenses are compatible between the two systems. The mount looks comically huge on the tiny body, but the Z50 is very compact. In fact, it weighs the same as its main rival, Canon's M6 Mark II, which has a much smaller mount and no built-in EVF. With the tiny 16-50mm f3.5-6.3 lens, the Z50 is discreet and small for tourism and street photography. At the same time, I love the way it feels. It's like a mini-me DSLR, thanks to the big, chunky grip. It also has lots of physical dials and buttons that give it a nice, tactile feel. However, it lacks a joystick for focus, and you can't use the rear screen as a touchpad with the camera to your eye. Instead, you have to use the more cumbersome four-way control wheel. The OLED EVF isn't quite as good as the one on the Z6. However, the 2.36 million dot display matches what you get on the A6400, X-T30, and M6 Mark II. It's bright, clear, and displays accurate colors and tones. The Z50 has a responsive 3.2-inch display that lets you control everything on the camera. It tilts out and 180 degrees downward, making it handy for selfies or vlogging. It's even got a decent menu system and a built-in flash. Overall, the Z50 handles better than its rivals and really feels like a professional camera, as it should in this category. Like its competition, the Z50 lacks the in-body stabilization available on the Z6 and Z7. Luckily, the first two lenses released with it, the 16-50mm and 50-250mm, are both stabilized. There are no other APS-C primes though, so Nikon needs to develop some soon to keep up with rivals. The Z50 can shoot at an impressive 11 frames per second with autofocus and auto exposure. However, thanks to the UHS-1 card, I was only able to get off about 10 to 15 shots before the buffer would fill, and it takes a long time to clear. There's also a silent shooting mode, which works in both single shot and burst modes. With the M6 Mark II, by comparison, you can only use silent mode for single shots. Now let's see how the Z50's autofocus stacks up against Sony's A6400, which is the gold standard in this category. With a 209-point phase detect system like the one on the Z6, it should deliver good AF performance. It fared pretty well, delivering a decent percentage of in-focus shots on fast-moving subjects. For regular shooting, it worked great, but was occasionally stymied by low-light conditions. However, Nikon lacks Sony software chops, so the face and eye detection system isn't nearly as good. The main problem I saw was lag compared to the real-time speed from Sony. If you're doing family photography, parties and the like, the Z50's AF is just fine. However, for the same price, the A6400 and even Canon's M6 Mark II have superior systems. While we're comparing cameras, the Z50's 20.9 megapixel sensor has less resolution than all its rivals, especially the 32 megapixel Canon M6 Mark II. As a result, it gave me fewer cropping options and slightly softer images. Otherwise, it delivered photos with accurate colors and lifelike skin tones. It also captures raw files with 14 bits of accuracy, so you can bring out details in shadows and highlights. As far as low light capability goes, I was able to take usable photos at up to about ISO 12800 without much loss in saturation or detail. I found noise levels to be better than all rivals except for the Sony A6400. That's key because the two zoom lenses you can get for it are super slow. When it comes to video, the Z50 is pretty good. 
It reads the entire sensor width and super samples it down to 4K size, just like Sony and Fujifilm do with the A6400 and X-T30 models. That beats the M6 II, which has soft 4K video because of line skipping. However, the Z50 only shoots 8-bit video and there's no log type profile, so you'll need to get your exposure right as there isn't a lot of room to fix it in post. By contrast, Fujifilm's X-T30 has 10-bit external video, and so it's more useful for serious video types. Video autofocus is a strong point, thanks to the phase detect system. Unlike Panasonic's contrast detect cameras, the Z50 does smooth, focused transitions without any hunting. With a display that tilts down, the Z50 is a good vlogging camera. However, you'll have to hold the camera in your hand as a gimbal or tripod will block the screen. On the other hand, you can install a microphone with no problems. However, there's no headphone jack. The Nikon Z50 is a good but not great debut from Nikon's APS-C mirrorless system. It's the best handling camera, but the A6400 has better autofocus, the X-T30 better video, and the M6 Mark II superior image quality and speed. If you're looking to graduate from an entry-level camera or smartphone and want an enthusiast camera that's easy to use, the Nikon Z50 is a good choice. I'd also recommend it if you already have a good collection of Nikon lenses. However, if you're not tied to Nikon and want a better all-around camera, get Fujifilm's X-T30 instead. It matches or beats the Z50 in most areas, handles very well, and offers much better lens options. If you enjoyed this video, hit subscribe, and for more on cameras, check out Engadget.com.